Good evening, everyone. We're just waiting for people to trickle in um, and we'll get started momentarily. Thanks for uh, joining us. Just going to wait a couple of minutes as we uh, wait for more attendees to join uh, the webinar. Thanks everyone for joining tonight. Going to start momentarily. Okay, thanks everyone for joining the Birmingham Parkway Feasibility Study public meeting tonight. My name is Dan Cushing. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And we're really excited to hear your uh, feedback and input on our feasibility study. Um, and we're really glad you could join us. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, so just gonna go over the meeting logistics and then hand it off um, to our, our project team here. So um, there's going to be a Q&A after the presentation and there's two ways that you can participate in the Q&A. You can use the raise hand function on Zoom or you can use the text Q&A feature that Zoom provides as well. Um, we'll be alternating between uh, written and spoken questions um, throughout the Q&A session and prior to the Q&A session um, will allow time for legislators to speak. Um, please let uh, me know in the chat if um, you're a legislator and would like to speak during the meeting. Um, and uh, we're going to have a public comment period after um, the uh, meeting tonight for two weeks and you can submit your public comments at mass.gov slash forms slash DCR dash public dash comments. Um, I also wanted to make sure that everyone knows that this meeting tonight will be recorded and that recording will be posted as well. Um, next slide. So now I just wanted to take the moment to thank Governor Baker, uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, uh, Secretary Thea Herides, and Commissioner Montgomery for their leadership in this process. And at this time, I'm going to pass over to Jeff Parenti, who will continue the presentation. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I wanted to uh, pause here. There was a question in the chat asking how many people are in the webinar. I know it's difficult, you can't see each other and uh, some of the features that the, the Zoom webinar has isn't available to everyone. Right now there's about 30 people, 30 attendees in the webinar uh, in the meeting tonight and I'll update that that number. I'm sure there will be some additional people that come in. And so we'll, we'll make sure that you have the information that we do in terms of attendance. But before I do anything else, I'd like to start with our mission statement, which is to protect, promote and enhance our commonwealth of natural cultural and recreational resources for the well-being of all. And the reason why I wanted to put that on the screen is just to make the point that our parkway system, which uh, is a big part of our responsibility, 
we see it as more than just a set of roadways. Uh, other roadways that are either owned by the city or DOT, uh, those are, are facilities that are intended for mobility and travel. Obviously people use parkways for that, but in addition to that, we also look at the parkways as a place where people go to recreate and also use as access to get to the rest of the park system. Of course, here in your neighborhood, we have the Charles River that's right across the street. And we don't want the parkway to serve as a barrier to access either the river, the reservation, the Paul Dudley White bike path. And so I'm excited for this project so that we can improve the parkways uh, to provide a better resource for you and to provide easier access to the river. And now I wanna introduce the project team both from the DCR side and from our consulting engineer, Par Corp. Uh, I'll start with myself, I'm the deputy chief engineer from DCR, uh, responsible for the parkway system. The DCR project manager for this project is Mark McLean. Jenny Norwood is our director of external affairs and partnerships. Dan Cushing, who you heard from earlier is the director of public engagement. Craig Cashman is the Director of Legislative Affairs, and Kelly Gavoni is here also, who is the Deputy Director of Legislative Affairs. And a little bit later, you'll be hearing from Amy Archer, who is the Project Manager from our Consulting Engineer Park Corporation. Next, a little bit of an agenda. Uh, we welcomed you a few minutes ago, and I'll talk about purpose and process of this study. And then Amy will start, and she'll go through the concepts that we have to show to you We'll start with the rotor, rotary, rotary area on the, on the western end of the project. We'll move through the boulevard section, and then we'll talk about the Market Street intersection on the east end of the project. After that presentation, all of you will have a chance to comment, as Dan explained, either through the Q&A feature or by raising your hand. And then we'll work through your text comments and your uh, anyone who wants to appear uh, and speak, and we'll go through those comments tonight. And then also, as Dan mentioned, we, there will be a public comment period that will last for two weeks and you can write to us your comments uh, until, until then. And then we'll close with the next steps of this project. Um, I do wanna point out the, the purpose of, we're calling it a feasibility study of the Birmingham Parkway area. Amy will show you the extents of the, the area that we are studying, but I want to stress that this is not a design project. It is a feasibility study. So we're, we're looking at the range of possible things that we could build in this section of Birmingham Parkway. So what you're going to see on the screen that Amy's going to show you, they may look like engineering drawings, but they're not. They're sketches that are drawn with a computer aided drafting program, but they are not engineering design. So we couldn't take any one of them and then go build it next week. We would need to go through a full design development and engineering process uh, before we can actually build any of the things that you're going to see tonight. So again, uh, keep your mind open. Amy's going to show you five concepts for the rotary. We're going to see three concepts for the, for the boulevard section. Uh, and just keep in mind too, uh, and make notes as you're going through and seeing these. We understand that there, some of you, they're very small on your screen. Some of you may be looking on a, on a telephone or a tablet. Uh, we know that there's a lot of detail, but as Dan mentioned, we will make this material available to you later so you can study it at your pace and at home and spend as much time as you need to. So right now I'll introduce Amy from Parkcorp. We'll take you through all of our concepts. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so Jeff started to talk a little bit about the study area, but to lay it out for you a little more officially here, we are looking at Birmingham Parkway from where it connects to North Beacon Street over to where it intersects Market Street. And beyond that, really this whole rotary type area of North Beacon Street, the Nantum Road, Soldiers Field Road. Uh, we have Brooks coming up on the west end there and Parsons coming up on the east side of the rotary. And then just off to the west on the other side of the river, Greenough Boulevard on the north side of the road there. So all of the intersections highlighted here in red are ones that are either connected to the study area and will be affected by the outcome of this. So they're incorporated kind of as a supplemental touch uh, or they are one of the primary intersections being studied here as part of the study. And as Jeff mentioned, we're gonna start on the west end 
We're gonna look at the rotary as a whole. Then we're gonna look at the parkway stretch between North Beacon Street and Market. And then we'll show you what we think we can do to improve the Market Street intersection a little bit. As we go through the slides, all of the alternatives have this legend and key off to the right to try to help you keep your bearings and understand what we're showing. So areas where we're removing pavement primarily and replacing that with what could be green space or parkland, we've got that highlighted in a green shade. We have a grayish tone to show where proposed roadways are so you can kind of distinguish where the proposed alignments are versus where the existing roadways are. And then there's a tannish color that indicates an ability to add a proposed pedestrian or bicycle facility. Um, as Jeff pointed out, part of the purpose here is to make sure that we're accommodating all users, not just the vehicular trips. So we're looking a lot at how can we better connect these communities? How can we make sure that the pet and bike connections are there and the facilities are there to better get people to and from where they wanna be? And then the key shows you which part of the study area we're talking about. So we're gonna start here on the West End with the Rotary. If you want to advance one slide, Jeff. Uh, thank you. So the, the, the main objective within the Rotary area, what we observed from doing our field inventory was that there are, there's a lot of pavement out there today, four lanes in each direction through this area is Soldiers Field Road and North Beacon Meet, and then is Nanantum and North Beacon Meet and there's a lot of weaving. So you have a lot of people trying to merge and diverge, you've got U-turns. It seems like there's a lot of confusion within this area, a lot of potential for sideswipe incidents. There are a fair number of crashes over the last four years that we pulled from MassDOT's database. So what we were trying to accomplish here was to eliminate that excessive weaving and give ourselves an opportunity to eliminate a vast amount of the pavement if possible. So really, each of these approaching roads has two lanes. Soldiers Field Road and North Beacon have two lanes per direction. Um, so we tried to take that and consolidate it, force them into intersections where there are, there's control of the movements, who has the right of way, and how they're gonna move through this area. So in this option, we've taken it down to two signal, we're keeping the signalization because the west and east ends of the rotary are signalized today. We're basically keeping that function under this alternative, shifting it down towards where the southern end of the rotary is, and it gives us the ability to eliminate this entire northern section and repurpose it as green space along the river's edge. So what we actually have there is not just the area of pavement being removed, but also the central part of the rotary that is currently disconnected from usable public space along the river is all going to be reconnected. So that is over two acres. We have about 2.3 acres of, of land there that would be reconnected to the riverfront space through this alternative. If we can go to the second alternative. So here essentially we're trying to accomplish the same thing. We're still removing the weaving. We're still putting the, this through. We did in both alternatives 1A and 1B prioritize North Beacon Street since that is Route 20. It is the primary through movement considered in this area based on preliminary historic data that we have. And the difference here between 1A and 1B is we considered developing the two intersections as roundabouts as opposed to signals. So I will point out that a signalized intersection can generally handle almost any capacity if you have the appropriate number of approach lanes and turn lanes, which can be customized. A roundabout is limited as a max capacity based on the number of rotating lanes. So these are shown as two lane roundabouts. There is a possibility as this moves into design, those may prove to be over capacity and signals may be the way to go. But for now, we're keeping them on the table. We're showing those both as an option. If we go to alternative 1C, there is, um, actually I apologize, I should have, noticed, should have pointed this out on alternative 1A to give you a little bit more bearing here. This property on the south is the old pool building. 
that is being reconstructed. The ultimate final use is still to be determined. Uh, it may be a pool again in the future, but it will continue to be a recreational use. Um, on the east side of that parcel is Roy's moving. And then just to the east of the rotary, here's the IHOP. Uh, so just to give people a little bit more bearing in this particular section. So if we go back to alternative 1C, Jeff, if you can advance one slide for me. So here we're looking at as the pool property redevelops into a future recreational use, how does that parcel get incorporated into this concept? So one notion was to give access to that property directly from the intersection, as you can see here on the west. So as North Beacon Street, Nanantum Road, and the property all con converge, that would become a four-way intersection as opposed to the T that we were showing in the previous two alternatives. Uh, that really requires us to kind of bend the North Beacon movement, as you can see here. This dissects the area that we were trying to give back to Riverside area. Um, it puts about an acre in front of the existing pool property, but it limits the additional area along the river to three quarters of an acre compared to that 2.3 that I had noticed pre noted previously. I'll also point out here in all of these alternatives, um, as I mentioned, the tan shows proposed improved ped and bike facilities. We're trying to make sure that there are sidewalk connections in the future where they don't exist today. Uh, we're trying to put crosswalks across all of these intersections so people can get to the riverfront and the PDW bikeway quicker. Uh, there are a lot of those ped and bike movements missing in the existing con condition that we really wanna make sure we're providing in the future. So if we advance one more to alternative 1D, the difference between 1C and 1D here, we understand that this pool property is going to redevelop, but if possible, we'd like to not have that take away from the area we could put along the river. So we said, all right, what if instead of putting access to this property at the intersection, we remove the access from the intersection? Now, this is not an actual proposed location. This isn't final. Um, the redevelopment of this parcel and the location of its driveway are to be determined in the future. But we were just showing this to mimic it not being at the intersection. So if we remove that from the intersection, we are able to reprioritize the North Beacon Street movements as the main thoroughfare. And that allows us to put the T intersection back at the west end of the project. So that's your mainly your difference here between 1C and 1D. And then we looked at one, or, one more alternative in this area. What if, since there is this ability to put more room along the river, what if that became the future recreational use? So instead of the pool parcel redeveloping, the roadway would now shift towards the existing pool parcel to accommodate the future recreational use itself being along the river's edge. So you'll see the bend here that that kind of imposes into the roadway network. It also really does kind of complicate these intersections to the east, um, movements between Parsons and North Beacon continuing east would be in this kind of dual intersection, if you will. So that is certainly something that would have to be um, continue to be addressed as things move forward to design. That would be a complexity that would have to be considered in detail and overcome there. Um, but I, I think you can see all of these intend to remove the excessive weaving that's there today, which will improve the safety, add pedestrian and bike improvements that don't exist today. And then we're trying to be cognizant and somewhat flexible of what may come of this reconstruction of the old pool parcel. So those are the five alternatives in area one. We can advance now to the parkway. So in these next three slides, I wanna make sure everyone's clear, we are looking east. So if you can imagine I-90 is off to the right of each of these diagrams. So we're looking at the parkway area as it stretches from North Beacon Street over to Market and Lincoln. Existing conditions are shown on top here. There's a approximately 20 foot median 
with two lanes of travel in each direction. Um, since this study started after COVID had hit and everything was in stay at home orders, we were not able to take new counts, but we did have quite a bit of um, historic data that we were able to pull from. And the traffic volumes indicate that this should not need two lanes of travel per direction. So the alternatives that we're proposing here are to eliminate one lane per direction and try to figure out how best to redistribute the remaining space. So in the first alternative here, alternative 2A, we keep the existing median. We put one lane per direction on either side of the median. And in doing so, if we only have one lane per direction, we need to make sure we're maintaining a minimum curb to curb width for emergency vehicle access and bypassing a potential stalled vehicle. So we are um, making sure we have shoulders here on either side to implement that necessary curb to curb width. This allows us to remove some space on the south side, which could allow a few more trees to be planted along I-90. Um, and then on the north side, it gives us room for at least a sidewalk. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, this being in the feasibility phase, not full design, it is a little unclear where exactly the right-of-way line is on the north side here. So this ideally would be a shared use path, but could certainly be at least a sidewalk. So that's alternative A in this section. If we can go to the next slide. Alternative B also maintains the existing median, but now we're putting the two lanes of travel, one per direction, both on the existing pavement on the south side. So where eastbound traffic is today, we would have one eastbound lane and one westbound lane utilizing that existing pavement space. That allows us to repurpose the pavement on the north side to a shared use path and then still remove up to 20 feet of space to contribute back to green space. So for the length of the parkway, if we removed all of that area, it would add about an acre of green space on the north side. So we would add about an acre of green space, we would get a shared use path, and we would have one lane per direction on what is currently the eastbound direction of travel. This would also be fairly cost effective since we're reusing existing pavement for travel, and we could even reuse existing pavement for the shared use lanes. So if we switch now to the last alternative in this section, we have 2C. Uh, so this imposes one lane per direction. It still intends to keep a median between those two. So there's some separation. So you still kind of have that Boulevard Parkway feel. Um, we've held the southern edge of the existing road, keeping the vehicular traffic as close to I-90 as we can to allow the pet and bike space to be as far away from I-90 as it can. Um, so you'll see here, if you compare existing to the proposed, there's a bit of flip-flop in construction here. We're repurposing some pavement for travel way, but we're removing some pavement to build a new median, and then we're removing some median space to build the new westbound travel. But this alternative, similar to 2B, does give us plenty of room to implement a shared use path along the north side of the proposed vehicle way. And this would still add about three quarters of an acre of green space on the north side of the roadway. So that being the last alternative in this area, we'll move to the last location, looking at how this connects into those kind of secondary or supplemental intersections that I noted at the beginning. So the primary of those is the intersection of the parkway with market and Lincoln. And the rendering here is snipped. Um, please keep in mind what happens to the west and exactly how the parkway ties in here will be dependent on the option selected in area two. Um, if I didn't point out already, you can also mix match any option from section one with any option from section two. So it could become alternative 1B with 2C or 1D with 2A. Uh, and then what happens here at Market and Lincoln will be dependent on what is selected in area two. But what we're trying to do is narrow the pavement on the parkway, tee it up better, 
remove a lot of the excess pavement that exists at this intersection that adds a lot of distance for pedestrian crossings as well as some confusion to the drivers. Um, try to realign things so they're as teed up as possible. And then the removal of green space on the north side will allow us to control access to these properties in the northwest and add the pedestrian and bike accommodations that we were showing uh, in the area two cross sections. So if you go to the next slide, Jeff, there are just a couple other intersections to touch on. So I circled here in blue, the other three intersections within the study area. So the intersection of Brooks and Nanantum is currently operating under the same signal coordination as the intersection just to the east. So whatever happens at the existing rotary, whether we go with alternative 1A through 1E, the one that's picked there, will in part dictate how we need to adjust this intersection and the timing at Nanantum and Brooks. North of that, we have North Beacon Street at Greenough Boulevard. We noticed there as we were doing our field review that there's limited visibility of the crosswalk that brings PEDS from the west side over to Greenough Boulevard and the um, bikeways along the river. There's also limited visibility as you're coming over the bridge. If you're coming from the rotary area and you're heading west over the river, over the bridge towards Greenough Boulevard, there's a lot of limited visibility. So we think at least an RFP would be warranted there. Um, some discussion about what will happen in the future with the area along Greenough Boulevard. And then the final intersection is where North Beacon Street goes under I-90. So today there aren't any pedestrian crossings because there aren't any pedestrian facilities, but since we're trying to add those and enhance the connectivity, there's going to be crossings here potentially. Uh, there's also limited visibility coming westbound on North Beacon under I-90 to this intersection. Uh, so there's a possibility here that this entire intersection maybe should be signalized. And those are things that will continue to be reviewed and determined officially in the future with the design element of the project. Okay, Amy, thank you very much. Um, I know that was a lot of material, a lot of information. Um, so we'll sort that out. We'll answer your questions in a minute. But uh, before we get to general questions and answers, I'll turn it back to, to Dan Cushing uh, for the next um, interim segment of the presentation. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks, Amy. So at this uh, point in the meeting, we're going to um, thank the uh, legislators who joined us. So um, we have uh, Representative Ke Kevin Honan and Representative Mike Moran and Senator Brownsberger. I'm gonna give them all an opportunity to uh, speak um, now. So I'm going to unmute uh, Rep. Mike Moran now, um, if you'd like to give a, a few words on the project. Um, I just allowed you to speak and you would have to unmute yourself here. Uh, hey, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I just want to, to briefly just say thank you to uh, DCR um, for all the work they've done in this. Uh, this is an extremely uh, exciting project, um, one that I think this community has been ready for for decades. Um, and I just really want to, uh, I guess I can't emphasize enough how, how grateful I am for all the work that DCR has done on this project and Commissioner Montgomery uh, for his hard work on it. And, uh, um, and everybody who's on this call, um, you know, this is, a, this is a real positive thing for our community. I think it's something we've been waiting for, like I said, for decades. Um, so I would just like everybody to stay focused, stay connected to this. Um, this is going, this is going to happen. We're going to make it happen. And, um, and it's something that we can all in the end of the day, be very, very proud of. And I just want to thank everybody for uh, their attendance and their participation on this. Thank you. Thanks representative. Uh, really appreciate your comments here and, um, thanks for joining tonight. Um, I'm going to unmute, uh, representative Kevin Honan now. Um, so I've allowed you to talk and you're going to have to unmute yourself now, if you'd like to say a couple of words. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. It's a very exciting proposal. I thank our neighborhood residents who are participating. 
It's an extraordinary opportunity for them to help design this whole area. Thank Rep. Moran for his leadership and Senator Brownsberger and D. Domenico. It's an extraordinary opportunity to put perhaps more trees and plants, possibly a dog park, refortifying the Bocce Court, youth and passive recreation, but the neighborhood will decide on what they want to see here. I know Rep. Moran has been an integral part of this from the beginning, so I thank him. And I walk down there quite a bit, and it's very challenging to get across to the Charles River, so I would absolutely recommend DCR to do as much as they possibly can. It also leads down to the boathouse, leads down to all those beautiful ball fields and hockey rinks. So I thank you for all your work and I thank Craig Cashman for keeping us informed of the developments and Commissioner Montgomery. So thank you all. Thanks Representative, really appreciate your comments too. Um, and now I'm gonna allow Senator Bronsberger to speak. Um, there we go and if you can unmute yourself. Thank you, and I, I join my uh, my colleagues in enthusiastic support for this project and a deep commitment to uh, staying with it for the over the next few years to to make sure we get to end of job and achieve the the great benefits that that are potentially potentially there with this project. And I, I thank everybody who's been involved with it um, from the DCR side as well. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, look forward to the public comments. Thanks, Senator. I appreciate your comments, too. So at this point in time, we're going to move to the Q&A portion of the presentation. So um, I'm going to start with some of the typed questions in the Q&A portion, and then I'll move to some of the uh, raised hands. And um, I did see some people chatting. Um, so I just wanted to say that if um, you'd like to have your your question read by me. I'm going to need it in the uh, Q&A portion of the Zoom functionality um, that gets it uh, saved because the chat won't be saved, but the rest of the Q&A will be saved. So it's just, uh, just going to need um, if people could provide their questions in there, that'd be great. So I'm going to start with uh, Christine's question here. Um, in alternative 1B, would there be stop signs going into the rotaries? How can we ensure that cars will slow down and stop for pedestrians and bikes? People drive very fast there. Also, will the bike lanes be separated with physical barriers from the cars? So the roundabouts have yield control entry. They are intended to slow people down to about a 15 to 20 mile per hour speed based on the geometry, the deflections coming in and the size of them. Um, so there is increased safety. It's not a stop, it is a yield control. Uh, right now we are showing most of the bike and peds as sidewalk in this area. Um, as we showed in the segments along the parkway, we were looking at having that be a separated shared use path, but there is enough space being added here that if that's a preference uh, to try to maintain a shared use path with some buffer to the roadway, uh, I believe that could certainly be accommodated as the design advances. Um, even the area here shown as the median could be separated if people had interest in maintaining the parkway type field with the parkway type feel with a treed median in the center, um, that could be accommodated as well. Thanks, Amy. Um, so on to uh, the next written question that I have here. Um, by uh, Patricia. Uh, could you recap where the parkway number two is located? Is it in front of 50 Leo B Parkway? Um, so I Googled quick where this parcel is and I believe it is on the east side of the parkway north of the Lincoln Street Market Street intersection. So the improvements that we're proposing for the parkway do not go up that stretch between Lincoln Street and Arsenal Street. They will end at the Market Street, Lincoln Street intersection. So it's between the rotary area that we were just discussing where North Beacon Street and the Parkway connect over to where the Parkway meets Market Street and Lincoln Street. Okay, uh, thanks Amy, uh, appreciate the answer there. Uh, I'm actually gonna move over to uh, raised hands now and I see that we have uh, 
I believe is John Reed. So John, I'm gonna allow you to talk here and then you can unmute yourself. So I'm gonna do that now. Great, good evening, everybody. Um, um, Mark, and, Mark and Jeff, it's great to see you. A Amy, great job with the presentation. You got a lot in there, but it's super clear. Great presentation. Um, great job, just wanna echo the thanks from uh, Representative Moran, Representative Honan, and Senator Brownsberger. I think this is fantastic. Um, we're we're thrilled, as you know, and as we've 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 um, discussed with you, um, the BPDA has been leading the AB Mobility Study and looking at at very similar geographies and some of the same intersections and issues. And um, it's it's uh, your your. Um, um, listening and collaboration on that project has been fantastic, and it's wonderful to see this. Um, couple thoughts. What one is a question? At the, the the question for the team would be, when we're um, considering the um, um, the benefits um, of rotaries versus four-way intersections, which would you say would be better and safer for bikes and peds? Um, so that would be a question. And I would think whatever would be safer and better for bikes and peds would be something we would support. Although we, we, I sure, I'm sure we'd like to take a closer look at this. And then moving on to the um, Leo Birmingham Parkway um, roadway ideas. Um, I, I think you would not be surprised to know that we favor uh, the idea where the, uh, uh, yeah, alternative number two where the, the two uh, lanes are combined. I, I, we think this would create more friction uh, and, and probably encourage slower and safer driving. I, I think single wider lanes would probably encourage more speeding. Um, also this option, th this alternative gives you the option to test this idea tactically. Um, we think it's a great idea. It's an idea that we, that we echo in the in the AB mobility plan, and uh, we would love to see the idea uh, tested tactically as soon as this summer, if that were feasible. So, wonderful idea, and strongly support that. And then moving on to the intersection of Market Street and Leo Birmingham, as you know, we we agree that that needs to be redesigned. This is looking uh, like it's moving in the right direction, absolutely. And I should let you know that. I think, as you know, it, part of the AB mobility study recommends uh, a two-way conversion of um, lane directions on, mm -hmm. on Lincoln Street, exactly right there. And we are now looking at accelerating that conversion uh, and looking and uh, entering into conversations with the uh, abutters about, uh, and, 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 and nearby neighborhood about making that change as soon as, as, soon as this year, 2021. Um, and so just wanted to make you aware of that. And then finally, we'd, we would love to uh, have an opportunity to look a little more closely at these slides, uh, if we could. So I was just wondering if they might be available online or otherwise to look at. But again, thank you so much. This is a, a great project. And this, is, this has been an excellent presentation. Thank you, Todd. Uh, Dan, I believe you mentioned everything is going to be available online following the meeting. Correct, we're gonna reshare that link at the end. Thanks. Yep, correct. So there will be, um, the, the presentation and the recording are gonna be available online once we're done. Actually, um, uh, uh, Tad, uh, was there any, um, any questions that uh, you needed us to, to provide answers for or um, any sort of follow-up that you'd like from us. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts this evening already about say the issue of rotaries versus um, four way intersections in terms of bike ped safety. Um, or if you need to think about that, it would be great to know. Um, and then in terms of the, um, the carriageways on Leo Birmingham Parkway, um, do you have, um, uh, do, do you see any, you know, are you leaning in any one direction on those? Um, so uh, Jeff or Amy, would you be able to speak to those? Um... Those two questions. So for the 
Signals versus roundabouts, both are considered safe for bikes and pedestrians. As I mentioned, the geometry really forces the vehicles to slow down. However, with the volume of vehicles here, if people have a preference, I think that'd be good for us to hear. Um, obviously at a signalized intersection, you would have the pedestrian push button. Vehicles would be stopped completely uh, as the pedestrians and bikes have a chance to cross. Uh, with the roundabouts, it's more everybody yielding the right of way to the bikes and peds. Uh, so if there's a greater level of comfort with one of those two, um, feel free to voice those opinions to us. And within the parkway section, Jeff, I don't think we've identified a preference ourselves. I don't know if, I know personally I may have one, but I don't think uh, we're pushing any one over another. Well, I'll be honest, I have mine, but I will wait to see what the public has to say. Uh, and Amy, I agree with what you said about roundabouts versus signals. It, it, they are both considered safe. We have an excellent design guide from MassDOT that came out just recently, which has a lot of excellent guidance for how to treat bicycles and pedestrians going through a, round, a modern roundabout. Now, obviously, rotaries is what we call them in traditionally in New England have a very bad reputation. We're trying to change the, the um, reputation of rotaries. We, we now call them modern roundabouts. And they are, if you, you can see in green here, the old rotary, it's barely a rotary. It has signals mixed in. Amy mentioned the weaving action in between. Modern roundabouts are smaller. Uh, they're, they're more carefully designed and they are intended to reduce the speeding of all, uh, the speed of all vehicles entering the circle to, as Amy mentioned, something like 15 miles an hour or so. So there's an advantage to that where if you're dealing with a signal, when the light is green, people are going at speed, uh, which if you are crossing with the signal, uh, with the walk sign, you're probably fine, but not everybody does. The advantage of a signal is during the design development, we can con directly control how during the development, how the vehicles are moving through the intersection and we can create periods in the cycle where each of the crosswalks are completely protected from any turning vehicles, right or left, and of course, any through vehicles, so that when you're in the crosswalk, and we can, we can prohibit right turns on red as well, so that if you are in the crosswalk, uh, then we, you will be uh, moving across the intersection without having any fear of someone turning right or left against you. I will say that regular intersections like this, you can see how long the crossing is. So it's quite a journey to get from one side to the other. But when contrast with the, with the roundabout, you can see how short the crossings are and there's a median refuge in the middle of, during your, your trip across the parkway. So in some senses, it comes down to personal preference. But I will say that in most cases, what I've heard from bicyclists and pedestrians is they like the idea of being able to push a button and getting the walk sign and that feeling of comfort and safety to cross at a signal. But again, I, I, I'm eager to hear what, what you have to say uh, during your comments tonight and during your written comments during the, the two week period following this meeting. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Amy. It's, uh, really appreciate the answers there. And um, here I'm gonna move on to the next raised hand. So that's uh, Harry Madison. I also noticed that Harry has a, a Q and A question. So I'm gonna allow them to talk now and you can unmute yourself. Great, thank you, Dan. Can you hear me? Yep. Great, so first of all, I wanted to echo the comments of the elected officials. This is a fantastic project. I was actually jogging along the river over the North Beacon Street Bridge intersection last night, right? And it's the whole thing is terrifying. Uh, it's pretty bad if you're driving too, and it's even worse if you're walking or biking. So uh, this is great. And I certainly share Tad's comments that if there's anything that you guys can do on a trial basis with Jersey barriers or whatever it is like this year, hey, all the better because right there's tons of people out trying to get, uh, you know, exercise and, uh, you know, out of the house these days. And the sooner this can be safer, the better. A few specific uh, sort of comments and questions. The shared youth use path that I think I saw in all the different options was 10 feet wide. Is that correct? I believe that is what was included so far, just for diagrammatic purposes, uh, okay. 10 feet is a minimum. Yeah, so, so I hope in the next version well. for diagrammatic purposes, it will be more like, uh, you know, 14 or 15 feet. Uh, 
because in like the path that we have the relatively recently paved path uh, a little bit further uh, east than this slide right if you're going down uh, you know approaching the western ab bridge the arsenal street bridge that path was paved recently and it's nice but even right if it's getting dark and there's a bite right there's a lot of curves you can't really see what's coming you know someone on a bike's coming one way someone on a bike's coming the other way uh, I mean, I'd really even prefer to see separated paths, uh, but I think a 10 foot wide path is way too, uh, way too narrow, especially when you have, you know, when you have a ton of space there, like you have on that bottom, uh, that bottom image, which is great, right? Can you, um, two separate paths would, uh, would certainly be, uh, I think the best situation. In terms of the roundabout uh, versus signalized intersection, I think it was Jeff's, the, was the one who was talking about the length of those crossings. Those are huge, long looking crossings. And certainly if you're walking slower, if you're with young kids or anything else, anything that makes those crossings shorter is way better. Uh, I do think that the, there's more refinement though needed on those roundabout designs, right? To, if you can jump to that slide, right? If you're going, yeah, I mean, if you're going straight sort of, you know, you're not turning around those roundabouts and it's, you it looks like you have pretty much a straight shot. Uh, you know, I could see people flying through there pretty quickly. Um, have you th thought about doing raised crosswalks or other uh, shifts like that in, to, in addition to the roundabouts to make sure everyone is going slower? I would consider that a, a design level uh, element, I think, as this progresses with a preferred alternative, those are things that can certainly be added. Yeah, that's great, because I think that if we were, if people were confident those would be added, then it's all the more reason to embrace a roundabout sort of design. Uh, but if that was something that was, no, that's off the table, then it's more scary to think, well, you know, I mean, people, people have cars that can corner pretty fast and, you know, might think it's, they're playing a video game or something. Uh, and then my last comment, the Birmingham Parkway, uh, Lincoln Street intersection. Uh, so there was a whole, there's a whole plan for Birmingham Parkway, but that's, I guess, is that, how does that project and those plans relate with what you're showing here? Um, that's, uh, that's a great question, Harry. Uh, Jeff, uh, would you have any insight into that or? I do. So this, uh, this came up a little bit earlier. This section of Birmingham Parkway is, is outside of the limit of the study that we asked Park to do and Amy to do. But this section is right now a part of multiple uh, land development projects that uh, BPDA is coordinating and they've been working with us on it. And so this section of Birmingham Parkway now, and, and, and this is kind of the intersection, to use a phrase, between the two projects or between the two sections of Birmingham Parkway. So even though it's outside of our study area, it is, uh, there is a planning effort underway for this section and it will be improved uh, as we go. And as you know, there's the, the, the land development that is occurring in the neighborhood uh, will be a part of that. So. Uh, there, the we and you heard from Tad Reed earlier. We've been working with him and his staff, and so we're excited to get that section done as well. But what we're talking about tonight is the section where the eastern terminus is here at at at, um, at Market Street. Right. So I guess just in terms of this one intersection, I hope that it's a like do it once and do it right, uh, you know, attitude. Because while this is better than what we have today, I think it still needs a lot more help than what's on this slide, right? If you're going westbound on Lincoln Street and, you know, you're trying to walk or bike across to get onto, you know, to go down to Birmingham Parkway, it needs a lot of work, a lot more than, uh, than what's on this slide. And is the, does this project only include the intersection or does it include, you know, the first 200 feet of, Bur of Birmingham Parkway on the left-hand side or all of Birmingham Parkway as you get down to you know, the North Beacon Street intersection? 
Uh, thanks for the question, Harry. I'm just going to jump in and say that we're going to, so we, uh, Jeff, if you could answer that question and then we're going to have to move on to other participants. Yeah. Um, just because it's really important, right? It's like, right. okay, if but, Lincoln Street's better and I can cross that intersection safely, that two lane section of Birmingham Parkway going down to North Beacon Street is super dangerous. And, uh, you know, again, we really need to connect the dots, not just fix the, you know, the dots here and there. Yes. Yeah, thanks so, for the time and thanks for the project. Thanks, Harry, as, as Amy explained, so this is our limit of work here. The, the red dots are the study intersections and then everything in between is included. So the, the three cross sections that she showed is in here. This is this section here. And then this intersection here, which we have to design later, as Amy also explained, because we don't know what, what we'll choose, which, which concept we'll choose for the boulevard section. And then of course, the, the, rot the rotary that we talked about before uh, and everything else here. And then the, the intersection you just asked about is the Eastern end of the project. So, and the reason why Amy is showing it as um, is only the, the first, if I can find it. We don't know what this is yet. That's why this is undefined. Once we choose the concept for this section here, the boulevard section, we'll then be able to design the entire intersection. The reason why we're showing it like this is because the, this concept and this design will have to follow what happens with the boulevard section. Then we can refine it. When we move into design development, this entire intersection will uh, develop and that design will evolve and you will all have a chance to participate in that. And so, yes, this intersection, um, as shown here, um, we can add more features, new features. It will probably shrink a little bit, but this is what you're seeing on the screen. And again, I want to stress that this is a concept that we're showing. It is not an engineering design. It's just a sketch and it's a way of getting the conversation started and to get your reactions to what we have, to the range of options that we have for this project. The Thanks. main intent was to show a reduction from two lanes per direction on the parkway approach to one lane per direction and show how that allows us to take back space that is excessive pavement today, limit a crosswalk that could be added on that leg. Thanks, Amy, and thanks, Jeff. So uh, I'm gonna unmute Wendy Landman now, and just um, for for everyone, if you have your hand risen, um, I give permissions to allow people to speak. So um, you don't see those permissions until I give uh, you don't see a, an unmute button until I give you the permissions to speak. So just as a heads up, I saw some people in the chat asking about that. Just wanted to make sure that that was uh, clear. And then after Wendy speaks, I'm going to move back to the written Q&A. So we have a lot of um, active participants and I'm glad. So um, just wanna make sure that we're moving along uh, steadily so everyone has an opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, Wendy, you can uh, unmute your mic now. Great, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, great, so uh, this is Wendy Landman from Walk Boston. Uh, I wanna echo the thanks uh, that so many people have already given. Uh, this project looks like it's moving in really terrific directions. Um, I would like to give a few uh, comments on, in particular, uh, the roundabout idea. Um, we at Walk Boston are not really very happy to see any roundabouts, even modern ones with two lanes, two travel lanes entering and leaving, uh, because it leaves pedestrians um, in a double threat situation where drivers are looking or there are, two, there are two lanes, so people um, may not see people in the crosswalk if they're in the other lane. Uh, the cars can block views of pedestrians. And in addition, um, we've heard a number of issues uh, from people with, um, who don't have good vision uh, that these unregulated intersections do not work very well for them uh, because in particular, drivers are looking over their left shoulders as they're approaching for other vehicles. And if you're approaching as a pedestrian from the right, uh, they're not seeing you. And for pedestrians, there's no clear uh, moment to enter the, the, the crosswalk. So I think um, on the one hand, uh, we're thrilled to see uh, the taming of the traffic in this part of the project and the reduction in the amount of roadway. But I think regulated intersections are or I should say signalized intersections are likely to be safer for people walking and people biking. And it 
I would urge you to also look at the possibility of adding, say, uh, refuge mediums in the intersections, because the, I agree the crossing distances are very long. These are big intersections, but it should be possible to do that in uh, signalized intersections, grab a little bit of space to create uh, some, some refuge islands there to shorten the crossing distances. So that's one thing. Um, I think though, you know, it's moving in terrific directions. Um, I want to echo what Harry said about shared pathways. We love to see separated walking and biking paths. Um, I don't know what the level of use out here is projected to be. So it's possible that shared use paths are okay, but 10 feet is not enough width. You really want enough width. So two people can walk next to each other side by side and have bikes or pedestrians passing in the other direction. And this is an area where there seems to be plenty of space. So it's not that we have to shrink it down so much to make it fit. Um, and the final comment would be about the lane widths that are shown on the roadway. Um, I, I want to agree that 2B looks like a really great idea that having um, two-way travel on the roadway is likely to slow drivers down. One-way uh, roads tend to encourage speed. I think uh, the 12-foot lanes, though, seem excessive here. Uh, in fact, I think that DCDR's own parkway guidelines call for 10 foot lanes. So I'm surprised that you're showing 12 foot lanes here. Um, and this is not an area where we have high speed traffic or want high speed traffic. So I would urge you to take a look at significantly narrowing the lane width to keep the, the travel speeds moderated. But I think the idea of moving that all over, um, all the travel, the vehicle travel over using an existing roadway bed and then um, bumping up uh, the green space on one side is a really terrific idea. So um, thank you. Very exciting to see this moving forward. Wendy, thanks for the thanks for the comments. Uh, really appreciate um, all the all the feedback uh, that you provided on uh, the roundabout and uh, alternative to be uh, very helpful for us. Um, so uh, I'm gonna move on to uh, the Q and A written portion now. Um, so thanks again, Wendy, and uh, I will get back to the hand risen portion uh, after we go through some more of the written questions. Um, so there, there are some comments that were written in the in the Q and A. So I'm gonna start with uh, Anthony here. So screening and buffering I-90 along Birmingham Parkway. Um, I'm not sure uh, if Jeff or Amy could speak to screening and buffering. I'm not entirely sure um, where we can, uh, um, if there's anything that needs to be spoken to that or if there needs to be more or specificity. I'm not sure if Anthony's saying he prefers the alternative that removes pavement along I-90 and had room to add trees, which was, Jeff, can you go back to the section two alternatives? I believe it was two A. So 2A, we were trying to remove pavement along I-90 and would have room to add additional trees there. I don't know if Anthony's saying that is his preferred alternative. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So uh, if Anthony, if you'd like to raise your hand or provide more written comment, that'd be great. Um, so now we're gonna go on to Joanne here. Um, how do the designs reflect the amount of housing development that is in planning in the area? Um, so that's a that's a really good question, and I know that. Um, so at the moment, we're still in the, um, the the feasibility study phase of this project, and um, I, I'm not sure if Jeff or Amy could speak to that at all. Yeah, I'll I'll take that one, Dan. Uh, I, that that question suggests about uh, that that gets to the idea of growth in traffic volumes, and the fear is that if we build more stuff, housing, office, retail, lab, etc. There'll be more cars using the parkways and aren't we in danger of making the parkways so small that there'll be congestion and that is a very valid point and a uh, and something that we need to be uh, we need to watch closely it is difficult especially now um, we we hired parkour right when the pandemic started last year we had planned on doing a full set of 2020 traffic counts as part of this study as we would with any study but uh, obviously with the shutdowns last year and the stay at home order, stay at home orders, we wouldn't learn very much about traffic counts during that time. 
So as we move into the design development phase, we're going to have to do a series of traffic counts as the economy recovers to see what traffic volumes will be or, or will be in what will end up being the existing condition 2021-22. And then from there, project what traffic volume growth will be over the next five to 10 years. That's a standard part of any traffic study that goes along with the design development. So that study, when we get to the design development phase, will take into consideration growth that we know is occurring. And BPDA is an excellent database that shows all the land development in the area. And the designer that we choose for that phase will go through all of that. And you'll have a chance to see that in the traffic study. And those questions will be answered. Plus, we add on what we call a background growth rate, which is any growth that's not in the pipeline that we don't know about yet that may occur over the next five to 10 years. All of those things will be taken into account when we do our design development. And that will inform us as to how big these intersections need to be here and here and how many approach lanes we need to handle all the traffic that we'll see today, tomorrow, and in the future as we plan for the future growth of our parkways and for the neighborhood. Thanks, Jeff. That's a very detailed answer. So um, we're going to continue with uh, these Q&A questions. Um, so I'm looking at John's question here. Um, so this one's about the, the rec use site. Um, and actually, uh, I'm just going to read it so that everyone knows what the question is. When will a decision be made on the rec use, the DCR pool from several years ago site? And what is the process for weighing in? So because we are uh, discussing the feasibility study tonight, um, we're trying to keep the, the discussion focused on that. And we understand that there are a lot of people who are interested in about the future rec use. Um, so we're going to continue talking about the feasibility study tonight. But please feel free to you know, subscribe to our, our uh, listserv and our emails. I'm actually going to type my email into the chat right now. And if anyone wants um, information about subscribing to newsletters or any sort of other DCR related information, please uh, follow up with me. Um, but we're going to continue with the discussion tonight on um, the feasibility study. So uh, thanks for the question, John. Um, the next question, is it possible for the modern roundabouts proposed in some of the section one alternatives to be one lane in out instead of two? Your section two alternatives show one lane in each direction. So I'm a bit confused. So I wanna clarify that the section two area picks up east of North Beacon Street and that allows for a vast reduction in traffic volumes based on the historic data we have uh, we believe that even the two lane roundabouts may not be big enough to handle the traffic in these areas, which is why they may, as I mentioned, end up having to be signalized intersections. Because um, as Jeff said, you can, you can appropriate a signalized intersection accordingly with the number of approach lanes and the number of turn lanes that you need. And a roundabout is really limited by the number of circulating lanes. So um, based on the historic data that we have, since we couldn't capture new counts, uh, we do believe that single lane roundabouts would not work in this area uh, and even the two lane roundabouts that are shown may prove to be uh, not able to handle the capacity of traffic volume that's in the area. Thanks Amy. Um, so I'm going to move on to Chuck's question here. Um, it's more of a comment. So uh, rotary at end of Parsons Street, I live on Parsons Street and a rotary would cause more traffic and delays getting on the rotary. Um, so that, thanks for the comment, Chuck. Um, that that kind of goes back to the point about the feasibility study and the, um, the elements that we're gonna need to take into consideration during the, 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 the design and such. So we, we appreciate the comment and uh, I'm gonna move on to another written comment. Um, what were the specific goals that were listed in the RFP for this planning project? So if you wanna go just back to the purpose slide, I mean, we essentially outlined what, what our main objective was here. And I think maybe Jeff didn't read the slide because it almost mimics exactly what was on DCR's general mission, um, but we are trying to improve the safety and accommodation of all users uh, with some intent to reduce confusion, eliminate excess pavement, and increase public green space. Thanks, Amy. 
Um, I'm going to do one more question from the Q&A and then move back to the raised hands. Um, so uh, Christine says, will there be a survey for determining which alternatives the community would like? So um, I, I believe I can answer this one. So we're currently going through this entire public process and we're allowing the public comment period for people to weigh in to, to determine which alternatives that they would like. And um, do you think we could actually go to the, um, uh, the, the slide that shows where they can get the recording and uh, submit public comment? Um, so this is the additional information where people can see tonight's recording and uh, the slide deck. So that's at mass.gov slash DCR slash past dash public dash meetings. And then you can also provide comment on this project at mass.gov slash DCR slash public dash comment. Um, and the public comment period will be up until April 8th, um, two weeks. And um, if, uh, yeah, and if there's any other um, uh, information regarding, uh, you know, subscribing to general info or project, uh, other project related listservs, um, mass.parks at mass.gov. And I also provided my email in the in the chat as well. So um, I hope that answers uh, your, your question, Christine. Um, and now I'm going to move back to the raised hands. So I see Bruce's hand is raised and I'm going to allow them to talk now and you can unmute yourself, Bruce. Hi, I very Hi, much. Bruce. Thanks. Very much appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I have a few comments. Uh, first, the uh, rotary idea, while great for traffic, unfortunately, my experience with rotaries is that people are not looking where pedestrians go. And I have to agree very strongly with Wendy's comment that they're much more dangerous for pedestrians and bicycles than uh, uh, intersections which have signals. So I would have to go uh, against the rotary concept. Secondly, um, the triangular area where Soldiers Field Road and Birmingham Parkway meets is there was a proposed development there. There's going to be a lot of density. Uh, and I, I don't know how that's going to affect your planning, but that is a definite, pretty definite area that's going to be developed. Um, the proposals on the parkway, I'd like to see a sidewalk on the south side. And I don't know if the shoulder is indicative of that, but it doesn't appear to be. Uh, also, there's going to be in the future a park, uh, the Birmingham South Rucci Park, in the triangular area there on the north side. And I would suggest that you're going to need some uh, a lane for parking, which doesn't seem to uh, be existent in any of the proposed plans. So those things need to be taken into consideration. I know their future development, but that triangular area uh, on the north side will be a public park eventually. We're working, we're going to be working on that very soon. So with that in mind, people coming in uh, will need a place to put cars. There's a good possibility that it'll be a dog park. People will come in as part of that and bring their dogs and we need to have some way for them to park. So with that in mind, uh, something needs to be done to accommodate uh, that area. Uh, and eliminating all parking lanes just isn't going to make it. Uh, and I'd like to also echo. Um, hello? Um, I'd like to echo the uh, area around the block path and bicycles. I frequently walk along the river in that area. And if there are two bicycles and somebody has a baby carrier behind the bicycle and you're walking, you're walking off the pathway, it needs to be uh, widened a bit. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Bruce, thanks for your comments. And, um, you know, talking about any of the other development that's happening in the area, it's very helpful to make sure that we, we 
consider the holistic approach for the entire uh, area as we're going into it. So very much appreciate your comments. And um, uh, at this point, I'm going to move to the next hand raised. Um, actually, one thing I wanted to mention regarding the, the uh, public process and public comment is that um, as this is just the beginning of the feasibility study uh, for the area, there will be additional meetings that take place, including the design for the different um, to, to share design concepts. So I just wanted to make sure that that was very clear. Um, so now I'm going to go to the, to the next hand raised here and that's, uh, uh, Kirsten Ryan. So, um, I'm going to unmute you now and, um, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I guess again, as, as others have said, this is very exciting, um, to see this beginning and I think it'll be great for the community. Um, uh, just kind of echoing some of Bruce's comments relating to the, you know, the park area, the bocce court area that's um, going to be improved. Yeah, again, um, a lot of import improvements for pedestrians and bicyclists, but in the spirit of accommodating all users, you know, I know there are, you know, elderly people that will want to be accessing that park and not going to be able to ride a bike or walk to it. It's, it's a little bit away from things. So yes, I agree. There should be a lane of parking along that area. Also, anything that you can do to make the entryways into the parkway and, and towards that park more, you know, safe and inviting to kind of draw people in to what will, you know, be improved. Um, I, I would think that would be wonderful. I have a question about the Market Street intersection. It didn't look like there was a, a crossing on the north side of that intersection at all. And I know BPDA is looking at this area and, and I, I also saw in BPDA's plans, it didn't look like there was any crosswalk there. Like what, it's, it's just sort of blank. So I, I think you really need a way for people to get across that side of the intersection safely and maybe with a refuge median as well. It's a very, very wide intersection. Um, so I guess that is a question is, have you thought about developing parking lanes along the, the park sure. area? Yes, yeah, since you and Bruce have both spoken to that, uh, there was discussion about that park developing and we, we had discussed that, you know, it may end up with a small parking lot of its own, whether it's a paved lot or a gravel lot, whatever it may end up being. Mm -hmm. um, so the sections that were shown are intended to be a typical cross section for that um, about a thousand foot stretch of the parkway there. Uh, not necessarily what would be the final layout at any one point. So if there ends up being a small parking lot for that, uh, certainly we could have a driveway into the parking lot that would have to cross the shared use path and you know, signing and striping and everything could help do that safely. Uh, if there is no specific parking lot, then a pull off for some on street parking along there uh, would make sense. So those are things that can be fleshed out in the design as it advance as it advances. Uh, and I just wanted to reiterate that those were intended to be typical cross sections okay. uh, for the for the whole stretch. But there Please. will be. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, but there will be finishing touches that need to happen at specific locations to accommodate things like that. Okay. Will you um, be including a plan views of those, the roadways in addition to the sections and sort of the next iteration or phase of the process? Yes, that will be part of design development, which is the next phase. But the, the so the engineering design has to show everything. It has to show drainage, yep. has to show utilities, has to show roadway curbing. Um, grading. So th those details will all be part of design development. You'll get to see and comment on all of that. Okay. I just, I guess just for, even for the feasibility phase, it's a little hard to envision with the typical, typical section without the corresponding plan view and, and just for my, for me, but yeah. thank you. Thanks, Kirsten, for your uh, comments, and uh, we we appreciate you know the feedback. Um, and at, at this 
point, I'm going to move to the next that hand that's risen. So um, I'm looking at Ellen McCraff here. So Ellen, I'm gonna un I'm gonna allow you to talk, and then you can unmute yourself. Hi. Uh it's Ellen and Kevin, we're uh, together. Uh, and we're also very close to this area. And this is a, I wanna thank uh, the DCR. It was a very good presentation, very clear. Uh, this is a great opportunity for uh, Alston Brighton. Uh, and I've been long-term co-president of the Hobart Park Neighborhood Association. I think we're the closest neighborhood association to this area. And, uh, so I'll keep my, I wanna keep my comments brief. I do have some, I'll start on the Brooks Street um, <clears throat> area first and move as you did your presentation. Uh, first, in terms of just overall comments, I am fully in favor of maximizing green space uh, and improving safe access to the Charles River significantly. It's, it is a disaster now. Secondly, I prioritize pedestrian and bike safety in a major way. I think you know parkways were designed to be more than just roads. I thought that Jeffrey introduction, I thought that was quite important. And improved recreation facilities for this neighborhood are important too. So when I start here, you know, I share the view. I, I know some of the research on modern roundabouts, I agree with it, but at the same time, I think it works better with lower volume traffic. There's high volume traffic here. And I'm really concerned about pedestrian bicycle safety with the roundabouts and two lanes of traffic. So I think there has to be signalization here. Uh, with that said, the signalization it's wide and so the timing of the traffic lights, but traffic engineers can get that done. And I think pedestrians and bicyclists are gonna feel much safer than the other alternative. Uh, secondly, to get as much as 2.3 acres of additional green space here is just fantastic. Uh, to move all, to move the recreation area across to the river is on one level quite attractive, right? I mean, it makes intuitive sense, right? Have them have a continuity. But then careful, careful attention has to be paid to safe access for pedestrians and bicyclists because many people in the immediate neighborhood would prefer walking or bicycling to the recreation area, whatever we decide to put there. Thirdly, moving further down onto Birmingham Parkway, uh, I fully agree with one lane each way closer to the pike. That maintains the existing medium, median. Uh, and then a tremendous amount of green space on the north side of the parkway. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, maintaining the median has another uh, uh, advantage. There are mature trees in the median and that, you know, I came down the parkway in a snowstorm and they, the snow clinging to it and the ice, I mean, it was like really lovely. And if you had the median with the trees buffering the two lanes of traffic, that is just a breakthrough in my view and would be such a great addition. I agree that the lane shouldn't be as wide, by the way. I think that's true. And I also agree with the earlier comments about Given the amount of green space on the other side, separate the possibility of having separate bike and pedestrian lanes, that would be a winner. Can we go to the, uh, my last comments more about the uh, North Beacon, where North Beacon meets um, Birmingham, please? Yeah. Uh, I bike this area a lot, both on the river and on Birmingham. This intersection is enormously dangerous right now. I mean, really bad. And I wanna highlight something that's outside the DCR's area. I think it's city. Under the park, under the highway, the mass bike, literally four or five cars sometimes are spread out at that intersection. It, it, it's really a dangerous spot. So I would urge, I think it's the city's road, 
a narrowing of Parsons under the underpass of the pike, because that would match issues of pedestrian safety that you all at DCR want to uh, uh, encourage. Uh, and in fact, this is kind of a personal issue. Uh, our elected officials know this. I was hit by a car on a bike right at that intersection where the flashing light is. So it strikes me that this is possible that you might have to signalize this area as well. And I'd also point out that we've got to think about, there's a public housing development, Faneuil Gardens. Many people live there and many children live there. And then you've got a pedestrian access issue in terms of their journey from where they live to the recreation area. Uh, I think that's really important to highlight. Uh, I know I've gone on long, I, I uh, apologize. Uh, I hope the comments were specific. Uh, I think this is, I've gone to a lot of public meetings. This is like a great opportunity for the neighborhood. And I think a lot of people in the neighborhood recognize it. I congratulate the DCR in terms of public engagement. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, important. And this, I, I think there's a question from Christian. I, I, I'm talking about narrowing the road under North Beacon Street under the Mass Pike uh, and wider sidewalks, for example, there. Okay, and I know that's not DCR property. I've, is that Ted? Is that the city? It's not the Pikes, right? Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if if anyone from the city uh, could like uh, that. That that's something that I can't really speak to okay, at, at DCR. But uh, Alan, I really appreciate your comments. And um, if uh, there's anything that we could add, uh, Jeff or Amy, that you would you would like to address from from Alan's comments, that. Um, well, Dan, just as far as I know, the area underneath, the, and we'll have to take a look. As, as part of design development, we'll, we always take a look at the property lines and make sure that we're working within the property lines. But in many cases, we have to work outside the DCR property to make the intersections uh, make sense. And so that means we go a little bit into, in this case, the city, and we'll, th that will be the case on Parsons, too. So we'll have to collaborate with the city. They'll comment on our plans of course, and then, um, and like all of you will have the opportunity to do, we'll develop now. I think we're getting pretty close to a preferred alternative on this section of Birmingham here. And my engineer brain is already kind of putting together some layouts uh, just mentally for this intersection as we're talking. So um, this, in, this will develop as we go. It's very important. It's, I think no one disagrees. Trying to navigate this intersection, no matter how you're doing it is, is very challenging. So I'm excited to get that redesigned and rebuilt myself. So thank you for the comment. Thank you all. And thanks to the elected officials too. This great, great opportunity for the neighborhood. Thanks again. Uh, so we're running close to time now. Uh, we're, 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 we were planned to stay till 730, but I'm going to go quickly to the written comments and try to get through them all. Um, so I'm looking at uh, Lindsay's comment here. Um, Hi there, I recognize that this may be out of the scope for this specific project, but I did want to express my growing concerns with the intersection at the other end of the parkway, intersection of Birmingham Western. I've witnessed too many accidents there in recent months, and I hope that something can be done to make it safer for everyone. Um, th thanks for your for your comment, Lindsay. Um, and uh, we're, we're gonna definitely take that into consideration, but um, I believe we're going to continue moving on with the uh, with the written comments. So th thanks again for your comment. Um, and uh, we're going to look to this one that says uh, Lincoln Street is very narrow for a two way, very tight, also no greenery. Um, and, and that's from an anonymous attendee. So uh, I want to thank that person um, for their for their comment as well. Um, and uh, sorry that I'm moving pretty quickly, but I know that uh, we're, we're tight on time and I wanna make sure that we respect everyone's time tonight. So uh, th thanks for your, for your comment. And I'm gonna move on to Barbara's comment here. Uh, this is sounding really good, thank you. As a nearby resident who bikes, could you trace the path of a bicyclist coming from Brook Street and heading east on the Charles River path? Then a bicyclist coming down Parsons and then cycling west along the river path. 
just trying to envision this. And I agree with Tad Reed, whatever is safest for bikes is best. All right, Dan, I'll try to do that. Um, but mm -hmm. let's do, I think she said she asked for two. Yep. So let me do the first one first. I think she's coming from, you said from Brooks, right? Yep. Um, a bicycle is coming from Brooks Street okay. and heading okay. east, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, heading east on the Charles River Path. Okay. So that means we have to get across the parkway. And I think that's the, that's the meat of the question. Uh, and so there keep in mind that signalized crosswalk right there at Brooks today. Yes, that's true. There's this crossing here. So there's multiple options. You're right, Amy. We, the, that person could use this one. It's, and that gives you direct access to the Paul Dudley White. Everything in tan here is an area that we could use for bicycle and pedestrian circulation. This doesn't really exist today. And so another option is to go here on in this area and then use this intersection to cross over. And remember, all of this in green is now not road anymore. This is some kind of open space and or pathway. So for example, here we could get you across on this edge and then move you to the either, depending which way you said eastbound. So we could build a little path extension here and then connect you up with the Paul Dudley Way here. But we have, we have so much room to work with here uh, and, and our path system will be designed as, as part of the design development. And that will be informed by the comments that we're, he we're hearing tonight, the com public comment period, and then as we develop the design in the next phase. Dan, read me the next one, the next path. I believe it's coming from Parsons. So now we're on the east side of the rotary. And this, this is one of the pedestrian movements we are really trying to accommodate because I saw people come up Parsons, head west all the way to where you just showed a person crossing at Brooks to head east mm. on the Paul W. White bike path and it's excessively out of the way. So we're trying to provide crosswalks at this intersection with Parsons in all directions. Mm. Um, and then as we show here, if you cross the intersection, then you could come up. And as, as Jeff just said, we could really put these walkways that connect to the Paul W. White just about anywhere uh, as this advances and we know that this pavement's going away, we could put this link in as most direct as possible. <laughs> Somebody put, we love a good, which entity does it belong to in Boston? Christine. Um, so I, at the moment, I just wanted to, to mention that, uh, that uh, Tad Reed from uh, the BPDA is on the, uh, on the call tonight and he's uh, participated, provided comments and uh, but we appreciate their, their presence and partnership as we're moving forward with our, with our uh, feasibility study. Sorry to interrupt, Amy. No problem. Um, so, so did we? Were we able to answer the question with regard to um, the, the the traveling at Parsons? Okay, uh, just making sure. I, I had a little. Uh, there was an interruption, unfortunately, but I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, situated. So. Um, I'm going to move on to the next written question then, um, as we're drawing close to, to, to time now. So um, uh, looking to uh, this one that says the proposal for single line lanes concerns me because they, sorry, because they single lane become completely unpassable when there is a fender bender or some other kind of obstruction such as road repair. Um, that, that, that does bring up a good point uh, for single lanes um, as uh, passing or fender benders uh, for, for traffic and such. But uh, we, we appreciate the, the comments. Um, this was an anonymous attendee, so I'm gonna say that that was answered. Um, and now we're gonna move to Aiden Redmond. Um, and uh, Aiden says, uh, have options been considered for a tunnel similar to under the Elliott Bridge or a wooden bridge similar to under the BU bridge uh, to on the Paul Dudley White path where North Beacon crosses the Charles River. Um, uh, I will add a short no. We are not considering tunnels or bridges or those are called grade separated options and uh, they are very expensive. Uh, and I think we can take care of the crossings that we need to uh, without bridges or tunnels with this project. 
Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next running comment. Um, and I, I recognize that we're approaching 730 now, but we're going to stay on for a couple minutes longer to try and address all the written comments. So we appreciate everyone's participation and we understand if people need to to go ahead, but we're going to continue and the, the recording will be up on our website at the um, links that we discussed about earlier. So I'm going to go um, to our next comment from Alan. Um, as a runner and cyclist, I love how the Circle Lights uh, conversation has gone so far. I'm curious if one or the other is demonstrably better with ve vehicle tra traffic, especially at rush hour. So I think we've kind of answered this. The roundabouts do have capacity limitations and the signals would allow some more flexibility with timing adjustments in different peak hours uh, with the lanes approaching and turn lanes being added as needed once the traffic counts are able to be captured. Uh, thanks, Amy. Um, so gonna go to another question from Kirsten. Uh, we have, uh, will plan views of the parkway be provided in addition to the section views? Uh, please also consider a lane of parking along the LMB park so it may be ex accessed by elderly or less mobile. And I believe that's the triangle that was being shown earlier. Um, yeah, right there. Um, I believe there was a vocal comment from her as well, right? Didn't we speak with yeah. her? Uh, I believe, yeah, I believe this was uh, provided as well. So I'm gonna move on to the next comment here. Um, thank you. Um, so two lane roads allow drivers to let emergency vehicles to pass them. Shouldn't we also consider the possibility that there may be a time at some point in the future when large numbers of people may have to evacuate from the city and single lane roads will be inadequate to accommodate such traffic. And I believe, Jeff, you answered about uh, the, the, the traffic volumes at um, during the design portion, but do you think you could speak quickly to the emergency vehicles? Yeah, so we, what, and th that is a good point about this. This is a little bit of an unusual approach to roadway design where you have a a single, you have, you have, these are curves here, these little rectangles are curved. So that would be the edge of the roadway surface. And then you, it's hard to see at the scale, but there's a white line on the right and a yellow line on the left. So you have a total of say 16 feet curb to curb. And we'll build that to whatever the fire department requires. Fire department usually requires 16, 18, 20 feet, depends, so that a fire truck can get by. That's what we design to if we choose this option. We are not going to design for mass um, for a, for a evacuation. I don't I don't believe any DCR parkways are designated as evacuation routes by the city of Boston. Uh, those will be other routes, so we are not designing for that. But we'll absolutely design for 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 regular emergencies, to borrow a phrase, for fire response, uh, and that this will give. Remember, cars the, the physical width of a car is about five and a half or six feet. From, from closed door to closed door. So if you have 16, 18 feet, that leaves you with 10 or 12 feet to, to squeeze by if there's a disabled vehicle in the gutter. Um, so what we're concerned about is that the ladder truck can get by uh, responding to a fire and that's what we'll design to. Okay, uh, thanks Jeff. So um, there are some comments in the Q&A as well that I'm gonna just read. Uh, roundabouts in this area are hazard and needs to be reconsidered. Also difficult for bikers. This is all a good beginning, but really needs more attention. Walking and biking is dangerous too, uh, too narrow. So thank you for that. Um, and we'll move on to the next one. The overwhelming development and building will put cars on the road during morning and evening hours. The bottleneck will be horrific in the small streets. How are you going to handle that? Uh, we did talk about how that would be addressed um, in, in the uh, design L, uh, portion. So um, I'm gonna move on to Stephanie uh, who said, can you please share the volume as a number expected through the intersections in section one? Um, do, do we have those numbers or? I don't have them in front of me. I wanted to stay away from a math conversation tonight because we are so early in the development of this project and having the traffic volume discussion would take a lot more time because it's so nuanced. There's just in this, just in this section alone, there are five approaches to two intersections. In addition, it's very difficult to get a handle on how people are moving through this rotary because it's so big 
and we don't know when people enter or where they're leaving. It's very difficult to count that. Uh, as Amy mentioned before, we have a, because of the, and we talked about the pandemic, I won't talk about that again, but Amy mentioned that we have a set of counts that, that we have before the pandemic. And so we studied those, we put them together, we pieced together how much volume we have. I also mentioned that because we're in the middle of a pandemic and we still have to design our project and choose a concept here, and we're climbing out of the pandemic and the economy recovers, we're gonna to have to continue to take traffic counts to make sure that our design accommodates volume today after the economy recovers and even beyond that, when we expect to have future growth in land development and general background traffic five to 10 years in the future. So the volume conversation we will have, I think it's too early to have that today. Everything you're seeing on the screen is a, is a concept. And as Amy mentioned, we are, we're showing a roundabout with two circulation lanes here, which we think we need as a minimum. And we may, we may need three if we find that in future traffic counts, that that's what we're, we require. We have computer models that represent our intersections, whether they be roundabouts or traffic signals. We can input all of the volumes in, we can play with the signal timings, we can add lanes, left turn lanes, through lanes, right turn lanes, et cetera. We can change the size of the roundabouts. We can model all of those things to try to find us a size of intersection that will be appropriate for the volumes that we expect. So that's work that will happen in earnest during the design development. This feasibility study that we're going to tonight is just really a means of getting the conversation started and trying to get to a concept that we prefer that we can turn to the designer in the next phase and move through the, the engineering part that will get us to a set that we can actually go and build. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, appreciate the answer. So I'm going to move on to the next um, Q&A. Uh, we too were questioning the crossings. This will come up likely with design, but there should be consideration of footbridges, raised walkways over the rotaries. There's a lot of traffic there to consider. So keep it moving while keeping it safe will be critical. Um, so thanks for your comment. And um, uh, so the next one says that some commentators were going on for some time and were afraid that other raised hands will not be able to speak at all. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to hit the last two raised hands for the night. So um, Eva, I'm gonna let Eva speak now. I'm gonna allow them to talk and if you could unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Um, I um, just want to echo what other people said that it's wonderful to have this project um, going and um, I am very comforted by what Mr. Parenti said that um, you guys are going to analyze traffic volumes and anticipated traffic volumes that we can expect as a result of growing development because um, I'm concerned that we are um, you know, so some people are just so focused on making things difficult for motorists that they are dooming us to wasting money down the road because we may be uh, narrowing roads when uh, th that will later become totally unpassable to, to traffic. You know, people will still have to have all their deliveries and personal trips and and uh, moving vans, emergency vehicles. I mean, we can go on and on for the, all the reasons that urban population has for sustaining traffic. So we cannot just look at it as an opportunity to make uh, the motorists' lives difficult. I, I, I didn't really uh, share uh, one of the uh, commenters' view that let's make the road only 10 feet because two, 12 feet is too much. I, if, if there is a snowy winter and the plows are going and they are pushing the snow to, to the side, you know, we, we really, and there should be a breakdown lane. And I believe that you, Mr. Parenti, mentioned that there would be a breakdown lane. So if there, there was a need for an emergency vehicle to pass other traffic, um, they, they would be able to do it. Or if there is even some, you know, road repair or a fender bender, um, it, we cannot just have one narrow 10 foot wide lane that um, will, if there's anything that happens there, it completely paralyzes the entire area. So, so that's one point I wanted to make. I also want to give some support to the people who ask for 
uh, parking to access this new Birmingham uh, park that will be built because there's a lot of development going on along um, Ber Birmingham Parkway, you know, just as Market Street becomes the parkway and, and people will need access um, to this park and also from other parts of the neighborhood, uh, the folks who will want to drive there. So um, it's great that we will move traffic lanes closer to the pike and therefore increase the width of, of the green space on, on the side of the river. But let's just make sure that um, we are not going to create traffic problems because when that happens down the road, everyone will be co complaining and we will have to spend tons of taxpayers' money to undo to those mistakes. I'm glad that you are paying attention to all, all modes of um, transportation, not just bicyclists, not just pedestrians, but also the people who that need those roads to commute to work, to run their errands and just live their lives. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. And uh, Jeff, if you'd like to, to re reply to Eva's comments, that, that'd be great. And uh, th thanks again, Eva. Okay, just, just quick. I mean, we, we I, I mentioned our, mission, our DCR's mission at the top of the presentation. And uh, I think we've heard from, from people who are interested in making sure we have enough roadway space for, for driving. And we've heard from people who are interested in improving facilities for bicyclists and for pedestrians and for their safety. We do have competing needs there. So we can't build a parkway that does everything for all groups. We're trying to find a medium where we can provide enough space for vehicles and only enough and no more than that. Because what's happened is, and you know by the existing rotary, that there's way too much road there. And as, as Amy showed in her, her diagrams and her concepts, all the light green that are there is a roadway that we just don't need and we can reclaim for park space. Uh, and, so, and, and as a part of that, we improve the access for pedestrians to the river. So we have a, a, our mission here is to find that balance, that sweet spot between enough room for cars and every, all of the things that we want to achieve for pedestrians and bicyclists and to keep to our mission of maintaining the green space and making more that we have the opportunity for here. We have both of those things in mind. So as we move on to the on to design development, once we choose a concept here for both the boulevard section and the rotary, then comes the difficult part of getting all the details right. And again, as Dan mentioned, you will have the opportunity to, to review and comment and everything that we're doing as part of that in meetings like this and in written comments, and you'll have access to all the materials that we have, and then you can inspect them at your own at, uh, at your own pace, and you can comment on them, and you'll have a full a full chance uh, of being included in, in that design development process when we get there. Thanks, Jeff. So we have uh, so I'm going to go to Moira McCraft here. I'm going to unmute them, and then we're going to do one more uh, Q and A from Kareem afterwards. So I'm going to allow you to talk, and you can unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Maura McCrave. I'm from Councilor Breeden's office. And I just wanted to say thanks to the DCR and our um, local reps for all their hard work on this. This is, we're really excited by it. Um, it looks fantastic so far. I just wanted to uh, voice our support for, I think it was alternative to B that you had in, yeah, it's up there, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, voice our support for that alternative um, just because I think it, uh, uh, creates a lot more green space and really prioritizes um, pedestrians and bicyclists on the Birmingham side um, and is something that could be implemented as soon as this summer and really create more outdoor space during the ongoing pandemic. I will note that um, I just wanted to say that uh, there has been some development along Soldiers, Soldiers Field Roads the Soldier Shield Roadside um, and Soldier Shield Place. There's been two developments uh, proposed or under construction or proposed there. But I will say that all of their uh, vehicle, um, they're obviously they can't get to that back of Leo Birmingham Parkway. So all of their planned traffic studies have all of their traffic going off onto Soldier Shield Road. And that's really, um, just something to note as sort of Birmingham Parkway and that area of Birmingham Parkway does not see a lot of traffic. And I think that's a 
that's why it's a, such a great spot to prioritize um, cyclists and pedestrians. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your comment, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to the counselor as well for, for uh, sending a, 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 a the staffer to the meeting is very helpful for us to try and keep everyone engaged through this entire process. So um, we're going to end on Kareem's comment here in the Q&A. Uh, we've gone over uh, some time now, but we really appreciate everyone staying on. And then I'm going to cap the meeting afterwards. So we're looking at Kareem. Uh, options 1D and 1C look somewhat similar in terms of minimal disruption and maximized river green space. Could one of you explain what the difference between the two options are and why one is superior to the other? Well, I will leave the, the question of superiority to all of you, but I will point out the differences here. I don't wanna make you dizzy, but I'm just going back and forth between the two of them. Uh, the first one here, and this, this is actually most similar to 1A. 1A has the access to the recreational site here as a part of the intersection. This 1D has it in the middle of the block it all depends on where we decide to put the parking, presuming that the recreational space stays on this side. And then going to 1C, what this alternative seeks to do is to create a little bit more space in front of the recreational site and just move the parkway away from it. That does bisect the open space and it does mean we have to tear up some of the um, existing green space and make it into pavement. I, there, there is a lot to be said for reusing pavement we already have and then here's a lot of contiguous open space that Amy pointed out before. So those are the main differences. I won't comment on one, what is superior. The way I look at it is we, we presented you with five concepts for this part of the project. Uh, the value judgments of which ones are superior, I leave to you. And, and, and to close, I, I think uh, just to, to close my comments for the night, as you consider your written comments in the, if you choose to be on this meeting, what helps us the most is if you have an alternative that you prefer, please tell us. I think we're pretty close to deciding on 2B for the, for the uh, it's not quite unanimous, but we've heard a lot of support for the alternative 2B, uh, which is this one for the boulevard section. And that's great. That gets us much closer to the, a decision that we need to make. Uh, and I've also heard from you that there's not too much support for roundabouts here. But aside from that, we'd like to hear from you uh, which one you prefer, and that will help us get closer to what we call a preferred alternative. And in that case, if we have that, we can then hand that to the designer for the design development for the engineering design, and then we can put together a construction bid package and then build it for you. So uh, that would be giving us some specifics on which ones you prefer would be the most helpful comments that we can get from you. Thanks, Jeff. And um, I want to thank everyone who stayed for the, the entirety of the meeting. I understand that it's gone on a little later than anticipated, but just to reiterate, um, the recording and tonight's slide deck will be available at mass.gov slash DCR slash past dash public dash meetings. Um, you'll also have an opportunity to comment throughout the next two weeks at mass.gov slash DCR slash public dash comments. Um, we really appreciate, you know, all of um, you coming out this evening and uh, we will um, follow up after the comment period ends as well with people's comments. And uh, again, we, we want to thank everyone and I hope you have a terrific evening. Going to end the uh, webinar now. So thanks everyone. <laughs>